All right, well, I just wanted to, uh, again, thank Intel for being one of the founding members of this group and obviously a strategic commitment and a continued uh, uh, cadence of contributions to this project. I also wanted to highlight, you know, we just had Applied Micro, AMD, and Intel back to back to back. I mean, talk about a group hug, right? Um, this community obviously brings rivals together uh, for the good of this community, and I really appreciate that work. So thank, thanks to all of you uh, for doing that. Um, I'm very excited to introduce uh, two special guests. Uh, we had Tim O'Reilly speak last year. I was really nervous before Tim got up because I had no idea what he was going to talk about, and it ended up being one of the highlights, I think, of the Open Compute Summit. Uh, and so I'd like to invite uh, Tim O'Reilly and Mark Zuckerberg up to speak. You know, uh, despite the fact that uh, Frank is the one who looks a little bit like Santa Claus, uh, I think you're the real Santa Claus behind this uh, uh, operation. You know, you got it started, what, five years ago now, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about how it started and why you did it. Sure, well, it's, it's really awesome to, to be here, and I just want to start off by thanking everyone in the community who's... Um, you know, put so much effort towards making the, the designs and contributing so much work towards uh, improving the overall efficiency of, uh, of the, the internet and, and all of the services that we build. So thank you guys all. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny to, to think back to the first one of these summits where um, I think it was in Facebook's cafeteria and we needed to do it between lunch and dinner uh, so that way people, could, our employees could go eat it when it was lunch and dinner time as well. So um, throughout the first Open Compute Summit, you could kind of hear people cooking and, and shuffling around dishes in the background. Um, so we've come a long way to here, and it's, um, it's very exciting to, to be here. D diff different kind of power consumption going on there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, in terms of why, why we're, we're interested in this, I mean, it's, you know, Facebook has always really been a systems company. I mean, even from the, the very early days when I was in college and when I was taking computer science classes, there were systems classes. And, um, and a lot of the work that we did early on was with open source and building systems. And a lot of the earlier social networks had difficulty scaling. And, you know, we took those challenges really seriously as a company. I think that that's part of the reason why, why early on we were able to develop um, and, and deliver such a, such a fast and efficient service. And, as time has gone on and we, we grew and got to a bigger scale, we are, we're always just looking for ways to do things more efficiently. And that's how we started thinking about designing our own um, hardware as well as the, all, of the, all of the software and systems that we use. And, um, we, but you weren't the first ones to design your own hardware. I mean, Google was famous for doing that years ago. Uh, you know, Amazon's done a lot in that area. But you guys did something that they didn't do, which is you opened it up. And said, hey, come on in, come to the party, let's figure out how to do this together better. We've made some real innovations, but we believe in the power of a community to, to build on that. So what made you decide to do that? Well, there were a bunch of, of pieces to this. I mean, just from a idealism perspective, I mean, we want to bring the, the technology and, and innovation that, that we're designing um, to the world. And one of the things that we're really proud of I mean, is that in addition to you know, all the contributions that we're making leading to greater efficiency and, and saving money, I mean, in the last three years alone, Facebook has saved more than a billion dollars in building out our infrastructure using open compute designs. On top of that, we, we've also saved a lot in terms of um, the energy consumption and, and emissions. So, um, you know, we've, in just the last year, we, we've um, saved the equivalent amount of energy of 40,000 homes in, in a year. And, um, and save the amount of emissions equivalent to taking 50,000 cars off, off the road for a year. So, I mean, those are things that we think are awesome. And if we can help bring those kind of savings and, and that kind of efficiency to other companies as well, then that's great. And we're really proud of that. Yeah. I mean, there's also this practical piece, which is what you're talking about, which is, you know, when you're the first company to design something, um, sometimes there's an advantage to keeping it proprietary and secret. But when, when like, there are other companies that, um, that had done some of this work, it, especially when we were getting started, then from our perspective, it was just much better to, to collaborate with the community and, um, and work together to do something that could blow past what anyone else had done. And that was kind of a no-brainer of a practical strategy that we wanted to execute. And I think now to this point, I mean, we're, we're I think, quite far ahead yeah. of Well, I, I think that's, that's really been the story for open source all along. Uh, you know, that in fact, it's this incredibly efficient way of doing 
industry leapfrog, you know, where you can build on the work of others. But a lot of people thought that it wouldn't work for hardware. And there certainly are challenges still on the hardware side. You don't have all the things you take for granted as a software developer around version control, around all the ways that we, over the last 25, 30 years, we've learned to share software designs. Um, it was kind of a bold move. What, what made you kind of think you could pull it off? Well, I do think that folks are heavily incentivized. I mean, people are spending so much money on building out infrastructure that, you know, if you can save the, the amount of money or the amount of efficiency that, um, that we're seeing, then I think that that creates a, a pretty broad incentive for a lot of folks to want to participate. And we've also just, I mean, Facebook is a partnership company. We're a social company, and we're, a lot of what our product does is just help bring, to, bring people together. And a lot of what we've tried to do um, in, in our corporate strategy is, is form partnerships with folks rather than trying to do everything ourselves. I mean, from a product level, we've always had this view that there are going to be way more social products than what we can build ourselves. We've tried to build a platform and make partnerships that other folks right, can right. do those as well. And um, with Open Compute, you know, it just seemed like we should try to do this on the hardware side. And now with the success of Open Compute, we're, we're also using this kind of a model um, for w another really big initiative that we have now, internet.org, which is our, our goal to try to bring affordable or even free basic internet services to uh, um, everyone in the world. And I mean, that's, that's I think, a, a really big deal for, for us and for the world at this point. And we, um, for the last you know, five or six years, our big rallying cry inside the company was, can we help connect a billion people? And you know, then we, we reached that milestone. So then it was, the, it was time for us to take a step back and think about, OK, well, what's the next big thing that we want to go do? And um, yeah, we're going to you know, help try to connect 1.1 and 1.2 and 1.3 billion people. But the real challenge is to try to um, build out a network that um, can help connect everyone over time. For, for people who don't necessarily know all the details of internet.org, what are you actually doing to accelerate into you know, that next five billion that isn't happening naturally as a result of just increased market penetration? Well, the important thing to kind of understand about this, I think, is that you know, people have talked about for a long time how you know, there are five billion mobile phones in the world. Um, over the next you know, five or seven or whatever number of years you, you your, your prediction is that those will prim primarily become smartphones, even if, if, yeah. if they're low-end smartphones. But I think the th thing that people really underestimate is that having a smartphone doesn't mean that you're actually connected, right? Because the expensive part about owning a smartphone that's connected to the internet is the internet and the network and the data, not the actual smartphone, right? I mean, right. if you own an iPhone, for example, it's $2,000 for two years, and about $500 of that is the phone, right? So the network and the data access costs three times as much. So basically, the approach that we're taking um, is use an, an open compute um, style um, partnership and industry coalition to try to make the, the network components that, that are necessary in, in all of the infrastructure costs, licensing spectrum, I and mean, all of the different things that go into delivering the internet um, cheaper, so that way you can bring the cost down of what you're, you're delivering to consumers. And then we're also trying to use the position that we have in the industry as um, by far the largest um, um, mobile service that people use, especially in the developing world, to help work with carriers to craft a business model where they can offer basic services, you know, things that are text-based, like email or messaging or weather access or um, you know, food prices or search or Wikipedia or kind of basic right. types of services or you know, basic social networking um, for free for folks so that people can get exposure to more things on the internet and then end up um, getting access to the, to the internet and so, buying uh, more access through that. So we think that there's a model here that's going to mm -hmm. make a lot of sense and that we'll end up getting more people on the internet. And a bunch of our early tests are very positive yeah. on this as so well. So I'm kind of hearing a strategic uh, thread here. You know, in the case of open compute, saying, OK, we're going to be using more and more server capacity over time. Uh, we better make it cheap and efficient. Yeah. Right? And we can use open for that. Oh, wait, you know, in the rest of the world, uh, we need to actually bring down uh, the, the, the data usage, the bandwidth usage, all the kinds of things that will make this more affordable. So you're kind of looking ahead at, at the, um, you know, the future expansion of the internet and where it's going, the mobile world where it's going, saying what, do we need to, what interventions do we need to do to make it more efficient for when it's 10 times the size or 100 times the size that it is today? That fair, yeah, or even just the bottleneck to, I mean, right now only a third of people in the world have any access to the internet at all, mm -hmm. right? And most of that, are, or maybe not most, but a lot of that is not even what you'd consider really internet access. It's, you know, folks who maybe um, pay for 
a day of data access here and there, but otherwise they're kind of trying to find free Wi-Fi hotspots where they can download their content and then turn off their data access so that they can save uh, money throughout the day. That's a third of the world. Two thirds of the world actually has no access to, to or can't afford or um, doesn't understand why they would want to spend the, the, the income that they have on, on getting access to that. And the trick to that isn't making cheaper cell phones, although that's really important yeah. too. It's making the network cost lower. So the hardware and all the other parts of delivering the network, it's not just the network infrastructure and hardware, but also things like making Spectrum easier and cheaper to get yeah. um, are really important. And if you could bring down the cost of that by um, 10x, then, which, which I think we can over time, um, then I think you can make a really big deal. So that's yeah. kind of the, that's the internet.org plan, and Open Compute, I think, plays a really big role in this, on the, um, both on the server and data center and um, you know, switch side of things. But if we can bring the network cost down by 10x and we can um, make some of the basic services consume 10x less data, which I think is also possible because that is something that hasn't been very well mm -hmm. optimized today, mm -hmm. and we can help some of the carriers in developing worlds um, implement some new business models that will help folks get on the internet while increasing their profits um, over time, then I, I actually think it's possible to expand the portion of the world that's going to be on the internet from one third to, um, I don't know, at least two thirds or more in the next, in the, next, right. in the coming years. So, so um, in your white paper, on internet.org, you talked about uh, you know, the shift to the knowledge economy and how that was an important part of this uh, economic shift worldwide. How do you uh, sort of connect that with Facebook's business today, which is really, you know, is, is much more social engagement, uh, people in their, their non-work time rather than, uh, you know, kind of a, a knowledge economy play, and yet you've characterized internet.org as accelerating the move to the knowledge economy. How does that play with Facebook's business? Well, the definition of the knowledge economy is really people having access to information and using it to make decisions, right, and, mm -hmm. and ultimately do work. But I actually think the lines between work and what isn't work are blurring a lot. And a lot of the time we're learning and, make, and uh, you know, connecting and, and creating relationships and um, forming opinions when we're not working as well. So that, I think, can be quite important. A lot of the work that we're doing as well is on the advertising side to try to bring all the same kind of tools to small businesses and, um, and, and smaller developers that historically have only been available to you know, really large companies that can do analysis on their customer bases, right, to mm -hmm. figure out what kind of ads they should run or how they should do promotions. And if you could bring those same tools to, you know, the local bakery or the barber, mm -hmm. um, or make it so that small developers, you know, the next set of folks who are, uh, you know, in their dorm room trying to build a business can grow their app faster and know more about um, the people who are using their app and build more personalized experiences, then that's awesome, right? And that's a lot of what I think we're trying to do and, and um, is one kind of small step in helping to build sure. this knowledge yeah, economy. Th yeah, there's certainly an argument to be made that a lot of the ad targeting technology could be used for relevant information targeting, you know, just information finding you. Yeah, they, but I mean, they, historically, a lot of um, the, the pre-knowledge economy, I think, is, you know, there are a lot of folks who are doing jobs where information, you know, it's, if, if you're a barber, for example, right, it's not, you're not necessarily using a lot of analytics and information on a day-to-day -day basis to do your job better. But I actually think in the future, that'll just be baked into how folks do business. Um, and you know, it's, it hasn't been scalable for, for a large portion of the world's population to make decisions and infer, interface with mm -hmm. their customers in that way, but I think it will be through yeah. a combination of, you know, the tools that we're building and, and um, other folks are, are building and yeah. just generally what the Internet is doing. Well, and I think just in general, thinking about uh, the knowledge economy very, very broadly, you, you think about how a, a service like Uber is adding information to a very old school, you know, physical world business and making it super uh, much more efficient, uh, much more social, this reputation in there, this, and yeah. you think, well, what other services are there in the future that could benefit? And I guess, uh, do you think at all about, you know, Facebook as a social operating system for, you know, the Internet, Internet of Things applications? Is that too far out? Well, I mean, our goal is, you know, operating system is tricky because it tends to imply um, you know, an environment for running applications and executing code, which is not what we are, right? Yeah. What, what we do is, um, you know, there's identity aspects and, and social aspects, and we try to make it so that any service can, you know, easily enable a person to bring their friends and their content and have a personalized experience in anything they want to do, which 
absolutely should almost automatically extend to wearables, and I'm sure that they're going to be, or uh, Internet of Things, and there's a lot of things that we're going to end up doing there to make that even better, but there's more that we can do. Yeah. Um, I, I think, though, that you know, when you're thinking about the knowledge economy broadly, there's, there's the developed world where there are going to be really nuanced and, and rich services that get developed, like what you're talking about, that just don't exist yet. Things like Uber to make it so that a lot of services that people have had forever can be more efficient. But as big of an opportunity that I'm really excited about are that you have all these folks who aren't on the internet at all yet, and um, you know, three, four billion people who don't have really much access to basic social services at all, right? So I mean, if, if you don't have the internet, that probably correlates pretty highly with not having access to you know, banking or credit to go buy a home or start a business. Yeah. Um, it probably correlates pretty highly to not having um, good healthcare or even information so that you can understand what is happening to you and, and your family and, and kind of w without even access to medicine, have basic um, knowledge about what um, how you can take care of your family better, things like education. So I think that bringing the internet, bringing the cost of the overall network down and delivering the internet to more people will have very profound impact on, on the overall you know, world in those ways as well. One of the things that comes to mind as I hear you talking, um, it kind of rings one of my you know, chimes, is we have this thing that some people call the shareholder value myth, that the only obligation of a company is to make money for its shareholders. And clearly, you're doing a bunch of things that are driven by uh, a kind of idealism here. And uh, how do you, what do you think is the responsibility of a company? You know, do we have to be rethinking the capitalist system? Is it okay for companies to just say, oh yeah, you know, wow, you know, I used to think about the financial crisis back in 2008, a bunch of companies go, you know, feeding at the trough, wrecking everything for everybody else, and you're sitting here going, we, we got to invest in energy efficiency because that really matters. We got to think about the, you know, the future of the knowledge economy in, in developing countries. How do you, how, you know, should every, be, should every CEO be thinking like that? I, I mean, I think so. We're, we're okay. lucky. I, I think <laughs> yeah. it's, and it's, uh, ideally, I think more folks would, would take longer term views, but, but I, I also think it's, you know, there aren't that many companies in the world that have the resources and the reach that, that Facebook has at this point. And, um, and, and I think that that means that we have more of a responsibility to, to do more of that kind of work. But, you know, it's, it's a really tricky thing. I mean, I remember we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary. I think it's um, next week, actually, or maybe the week after, but it's, it's like, it's February 4th. And the, um, so I, I've just been reflecting a lot on the, the first 10 years of Facebook. And one of the things that, that I remember from really early on, I, um, I had my friend, one of my friends who I used to do most of my computer science problem sets with when I was in school, and now he, he works at Facebook and runs a bunch of our engineering team. And um, I, I remember right after releasing the first version of, of Facebook at, at Harvard, um, we had this conversation where it was like, all right, it's awesome that now there's this utility and, and community at our school, but uh, clearly someone, someday someone is going to build this for the world. And it didn't even occur to me that, um, that it could be us, right? Uh -huh. And you know, it wasn't even like, oh, maybe it'll be us, or hopefully it'll be us. It's like, no chance, right? It's like, of course it's going to be you know, one of these other companies that's like a company and has you know, all these engineers and all these servers and serves all these people. So one of the big things that I've just been reflecting on is like going backwards, why um, were we the ones to kind of do this, this part of the, the infrastructure? And um, I think the reason is just because we kind of cared more, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, at each step along the way, um, we thought that you know, m helping people connect and building the service for people was it was like a right. It was something that people should have. Um, we thought it was really good. And then you'd read the press or the blogs mm -hmm. about us, and it would always be about how um, this was a fad or it couldn't get to the next level, or even if it did, yeah. it wouldn't be profitable and it wouldn't be a business. Yeah. So I actually think like a lot of this stuff has a lot of parallels to the work that we're doing with internet.org today. Mm -hmm. Because you know, there's no real business plan that supports mm -hmm. um, the billions of dollars of investment that we're going to make in trying to, yeah. um, to, to bring connectivity to the rest of the world. Um, but we're doing it because we think it's the right thing to do. And I think that that tends to have a good way of catching up in, in a positive way to you yeah. over time. And um, I don't know. I, I think a lot of times the best things that people do, it's like you, you're doing it because you're passionate about it before there's a clear business case. But if you're doing something good, a lot of the time there is a way to make a profit off of it later on, whether it's 10 or 20 years later. So um, I don't know. It's, it's one of the tricky things uh, about I, capitalism. I, you I, can't connect all the dots ahead of time. No, I, I think that's super. And, and in a lot of ways, that's a great place to end. I think the, uh, 
I still remember the first time I met you. You know, I spent a lot of time with a lot of internet entrepreneurs, and there's some people are the real deal and some people aren't. Uh, and I remember thinking, wow, Mark's the real deal. You, I, I, I came, uh, I have this memory of what they said about Michelangelo, who used to basically chip away at the stone, finding the statue inside the stone. And I had that sense of, you know, you have this problem you're chewing on, and you're kind of chipping away at things until you see the pattern that you're, you know, you're trying to uncover. And, uh, you know, when you first started thinking about this sort of, you know, social layer, uh, I think, it, you know, it, it, was, it was an idea that you thought could be a big idea, but it's gotten bigger as you've kind of uncovered more and more of the pattern. And it's, it's super exciting to watch you do that. So, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, and thank you guys. And thank you guys. All right, well, thank you, Tim, and, and, and thank you, Mark, for, for obviously the vision and, and creating the culture within Facebook that gave us the opportunity to create something like Open Compute. Um, 